Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here, and today we are going over lesson number 13, and it's going to be all about optimal ranges for thyroid lab tests. And what I'm looking at here is a diagram that I have on one of the pages of my website, which goes over all this information. So I'm going to be verbalizing it, but if you want to take a look at it and kind of go into it in more detail, you're certainly welcome to do that. And I'll have the link below so that you can go and find this page. Uh, but today, let's start the topic by talking about what a full thyroid lab panel is. And we'll go over this just briefly because I don't think we need to spend too much, too much time on it. But basically, if you are somebody who has or suspects that you have thyroid disease, you need to be starting with this complete panel. Now, you don't need to necessarily order this panel each and every time you evaluate your labs, but you absolutely need to get started with this first. And the reason for that is it it draws a picture as to what is happening in your body. So normally, and we'll look at all these in detail here, but normally if you if your doctor suspects that you have thyroid disease, he or she may simply order a screening test, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which is right here. So that's known as the TSH. Now often they may do, your doctor may do a TSH with reflex to T4, but you can see here that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other thyroid lab tests. So if you only order one of these tests and you, you're you like, and it comes up as normal, well there's many others that could be abnormal to explain what is happening in your body. And most physicians will not order these tests unless prompted to by you. Um, and that has to do with how physicians look and treat the thyroid and we've talked about this before why there's so much controversy and, and so on but really what you need to do is you need to find a doctor that is going to order these tests so real quick we'll go over this full thyroid lab panel then we'll talk about the difference between optimal uh, and normal here so number one TSH definitely need, need that free T3 and free T4 so you want to be looking at your free thyroid hormones reverse T3 this in conjunction with your free thyroid hormones gives you an idea as to how well you are converting thyroid hormone one of my favorite tests is total T3, which can give you more of a long-term evaluation of what's happening with your T3. And then also, of course, the thyroid or the thyroid autoantibodies, which can help you understand if you have an autoimmune disease or, or potentially have an autoimmune disease. So those would be thyroid globulin antibody and thyroid peroxidase antibody. So I've, I've also put here the abbreviation. So TSH, FT3, FT4, RT3, T3, TGAB, and TPOAB. So that's how you might see them on your lab report. So that is the complete thyroid panel for evaluating your thyroid function. Now let's talk about the difference between optimal and normal. So normal is, and you can see it in this col column, normal is what is known as the reference range that the laboratory produces whenever it gives you any sort of lab result. And this reference range is supposed to contain about 95% of the population. So 95% of people, if they get their lab result taken, they'll fall somewhere on this range. So if you look at, let's just look at free T3, 95% of people will fall between 2.0 and 4.4. And what they do by kicking out the last 5% is they try to optimize it so that most people will fall within that range. But the problem is they generate that range based upon the results of everybody who gets their lab drawn from that lab company. So it's a, it's a generated statistical report. And that doesn't mean that it's an optimal range, okay? Because what's happening is they're including people in there who may or may not be healthy. And, and when you look at the average health of the population in the United States. I think if you went outside and you sampled 100 people just randomly on the, on the street or at a grocery store, would you want to compare yourselves to that? That's not my ideal of what healthy is. And that's where we get in between the big difference of normal range and optimal range. So optimal, optimal range over here is what I call the ideal range that would be seen in an active, healthy adult without any medical or metabolic conditions. And when you look at your results, you may fall somewhere within this normal range, right? Which is the reference range the lab created. But how do you compare to an, to what you should be if you're 100% healthy? So if we grabbed 100 healthy people and we checked their labs, they would be a lot tighter in terms of their reference range as opposed to if we just grabbed 100 people outside of, you know, in the population and compared that. So there's a big difference between the normal range and the optimal range. And doctors know this. They just fail to apply this logic 
to hormones for some reason. They apply it to blood pressure. They apply it even to cholesterol. They apply it to all these other factors. But when it comes to hormones, they're not taught to apply or to use this logic. So you're going to have to. And so what I've done here is I've come up with the normal range, the normal ranges typically. Now these normal ranges will vary based on your lab, but they're generally around this range. And then the optimal ranges over on, on the uh, right side here. So I'll talk about some of these optimal ranges and you can compare yours if you have your lab tests out in front of you. So first let's talk about TSH. And before we get into this, let me just say that these values are based upon people who are not taking thyroid medication. So this is for diagnostic purposes, uh, mostly. Now, they, there is some value if you are taking thyroid medication, but but that's a different story, the way that you look at labs. But if, you, if you're just getting diagnosed and you're not sure if something's wrong, this is the, the result that you want to use. So for TSH, most healthy adults are less than 1, but somewhere, you know, usually greater than 0.5. So 0.5 to 1.0. And that's way different than the 0.45 to 4.5 that is the normal reference range. So that reference range is huge. We're just narrowing it down to this optimal range, especially for TSH. Now, free T3, with a, with a normal range of 2 to 2, 2 to 4.4, you want yours to be about 3.8 to 4.4. So that's usually on the upper, say, 70 to 80th percentile of that range. That's where normal healthy adults usually, usually live. For free T4, it's the same thing. So if the, generally the range is somewhere between 0.82 to 1.77, so you can see sort of the spread there. You want yours to be 1.4 to 1.77, so you can see you're going all the way up to the tippy top of that of that range. Reverse T3 is another big one, and that one's a little bit different. So that range is quite wide. So if you look here, 9.2 to 24.1, that's a huge range. Now, luckily for reverse T3, you just want yours less than 15, and generally. The smaller that value, the better it is that you will feel. Because as reverse T3 increases, it directly competes with free T3 for looking at your, for binding at the cellular level. So what you'll find in a lot of people is that they have a, a low or even a mid-range free T3, but a very high reverse T3. And that negates out any value you get from having this normal to, to mid-range um, free T3. So you have to look at these in tandem with one another. Total T3 is, is up next. Total T3, I like to be somewhere in the top end of that range as well. So 150 to 180. And you can see the spread here is, is more than 100 points. But you want to tighten yours up to be about the difference between 30. So, you know, 150 to 180. Thyroglobulin antibody and thyroid peroxidase antibodies, those are pretty easy. You want those to be as close to zero as you possibly can get them. Now, you can, you can track uh, these values as you go as well. But generally, the presence of any antibody is not ideal. But there is some allowance because some people will have a small amount and we're not sure if that's maybe being picked up by mistake through the the way that the the test is uh or, or how the test is performed or, or something like that but so you might have a slight slight elevation but it, it shouldn't be over this sort of range here so that's why it says it goes from zero to point zero point nine and zero to 34 but you want yours as close to zero as you can possibly get so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. The difference between normal and optimal and why you want to compare your results to optimal healthy adults. Because if and this just makes logical sense. I, I don't know why you would do it any other way. You want to compare yourself to the healthiest version of yourself. And the only way to do that is to compare your results to what it would be if, if you compared 100 healthy other people that are around your same age and around your same gender. So that's how you do it. And that's why this is so important. Don't accept that your labs are normal even if you're feeling crummy. Because if you're symptomatic, that means you have fatigue, you have hair loss, you have dry skin, constipation, you're gaining weight, you're depressed. We go through the list of symptoms. If you have those, they are not normal. It, it's an indication that something is wrong. So look at, use this um, this chart here and this diagram and compare your results. You can just plop in your, uh, norm, your reference range, which is going to be a little bit different. But try to compare yourself to this healthy range, which can be adjusted based off of your results. So that's it for today. I hope you guys found this helpful. If you have any questions, please leave them below. There's a lot of questions surrounding optimal and why doesn't my doctor get it? And so hopefully this explains to you why that is and why there's so, so many issues with just the interpretation of these lab tests. So otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one.